everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We'll get started in just about two minutes here. So we'll let you log on and get situated before we go ahead and kick off our webinar with Claudia St. John and Affinity HR Group. Hello everyone who has just joined us within the last minute here. We're going to wait until we hit that top of the hour and get this program kicked off right then. So we encourage you to get situated and ready to take some notes. Hello everyone and thank you for joining. I know that we still have a few people dialing in. We will get started in about 30 seconds here. So I, I do want to encourage everybody to go ahead and get situated. We have our presenters on deck and we will get started very shortly. All right, thank you everyone for being able to join today's webinar, Workplace Response, COVID-19, How to Plan. My name is Emily Sikulski and I will be your host of today's webinar. Before we begin, I do wanna remind you of a few housekeeping items that Zoom does provide. As of right now, all attendees are on mute and will stay muted throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, please utilize that chat within Zoom's platform where you can connect with me, your webinar host, and I can help answer any questions that you might have. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be shared with you after the webinar concludes. It takes about 24 hours to share this webinar recording with everyone. So please be patient as we get this out to you. If you do have questions for our presenters today, please feel free to again, submit that through the Q&A box on your webinar toolbar. Our presenters will be saving time at the end to answer your questions. If we do not get through everything, we will be able to provide the speakers information so you can also reach out to them directly. With the COVID-19 virus impacting uh, people and businesses growing more and more serious every day, many companies are left trying to figure out their best options for how to protect their employees, balance business needs, and satisfy client demand. Join our presenters, Claudia St. John and Paige McAllister, as they help us navigate through this really tough time. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to pass it over to Claudia St. John to kick us off today. Go ahead, Claudia. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm trying to share my video. Let me see if I can do that. Cannot share your video because the host has stopped it. <laughs> but Emily, can you, uh, can you help me share my video? 
I can certainly work on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let me know when you think it's ready. Um, hi, everybody. This is Claudia St. John. Uh, I'm here with Paige McAllister, who is my Vice President of Compliance. Um, we work with Affinity HR Group. We are the partner of many trade associations across the country, uh, many of whom were able to make this happen for us today. So the first thing I'd like to do is to thank all the association partners who have been and, um, and Kevin and the folks and Laura and the folks uh, at Smith Beckland, Buckland who did help, uh, but all of our association partners. Um, so I just wanted to, um, to uh, preface all of my comments by saying that this is a pretty tough time and I don't need to tell any of you that. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of uh, concern. Each and every one of your situations, at least those of you who have reached out to us in the last week or so, have very, very unique situations. And so our ability to really present everything and answer all of your questions in this presentation is limited, but we're going to scream through as much information as we can. Um, and then we're going to, um, uh, once we go through that, um, we're going to take your questions at the end. So my hope is that we're going to take about a half an hour worth of questions or, or, or the presentation and then get to your questions. If you have not, uh, if you haven't if you had your questions answered, again, please, please present them to Emily in that in the Q&A box. We are committed to answering all of them. So you will get your, your questions answered um, if we haven't answered through this. The other things I want to tell you are that, again, everybody's situation is unique. We are not attorneys. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about also is affected not only by um, your circumstances, but also your size, your industry, your location, the state that you're in. So a lot of that is unique that we can't answer necessarily without doing a touch more research. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to say is that um, we all deal with stress differently. I tend to deal with it with humor. So I may be a little light and glib from time to time in this presentation. Please accept my apology if uh, you find nothing funny about this situation. I don't either. It's just kind of how I roll. So with that, I'm going to get started unless, Emily, do you have anything to report on the video or should we just get going the way we are, which is fine with me? I think we could go ahead and get going. And I do just want to say as a reminder to everyone on the line who is still dialing in, this will be recorded again. So if you do miss anything or have to jump off early, we'll be able to circulate this recording to all of you. Great. And as I said, we have left about a half an hour at the end to answer your questions, but given the size of the audience today, um, we are certainly only going to be able to get a fraction of them. So we're going to collect a sample of the different types of issues that folks are asking questions again. Um, but again, we will uh, provide you uh, those answers um, after we are done with this webinar. So what I want to say is a lot of folks have said, I've never seen anything like this. Well, really none of us have. Um, it's, a, it's a unique and and fairly awful situation that we're all facing, but it is a temporary one. This is a very temporary situation. And the ways that you adjust your workplace, your policies, how you structure uh, your leave policies or allow telecommuting or don't allow telecommuting, whatever you do today um, to address this situ situation um, is not precedent setting. You can do things different just for today. Each of your situations is going to be different and each of the situations of each of your employees is going to be different. Um, they may have different technology needs or quarantine needs or childcare needs. So all of those things are going to vary. I look at this MacGyver toolkit uh, and you know it just reminds me that bubble gum and rubber bands, that's what we're talking about here. You're just trying to get through this moment in time and we will and you will i also want to tell you affinity hr group we are a virtual national remote 
organization. We will not be disrupted by this, uh, by this, this virus um, or the pandemic. We all work remotely. Um, and so our business continuity is um, guaranteed. We're here to help you. So don't worry if you need any help as we go along. Um, connect with us on LinkedIn. Connect with us on email. And we will be providing the email at the end. Our, our web address is at the bottom here. But your organization, your, your association is committed to providing resources to you. We are committed to providing resources to you. So you have support. If we don't answer your questions today, we will go forward. But I just want to make sure you know you don't don't need to have all of the answers and those answers are going to change just since we started developing this webinar um, two days ago I've I've completely revamped it three times because the situation is changing so dramatically so what we're going to talk about the high the high parts that we're going to be talking about the the, the, the talking points are basically first how to maintain a healthy and sanitary workplace we've seen a lot about this but i just want to give you some ideas how to treat and deal with the most vulnerable employees that you have what to do with sick employees how to ensure continuity of work as best as possible and then issues relating relating to leave laws policy pay um, you know, reduction in work, uh, layoffs, all of those things that, that may unfortunately be a short-term um, need for you. So the first thing I want to say is a healthy workforce, um, a, a, a healthy workplace. Um, CDC guidelines, and that's a great resource. That's what we really are relying on in all of our recommendations, um, recommend at least six feet apart. A lot of our employees are working back to back or very close within cubicles. So try and create physical space so that folks aren't working so closely together. You know, you might have, you know, one or two people work in the kitchen. You might have somebody work out in the, in the warehouse, you may be able to send home half of your employees so that you don't have as many people in as close proximity. So the most ability for you to create space is a great idea. Also consider rotating your schedules. So perhaps you can have folks come in the morning and then work in the office in the morning and then work remotely at home in the afternoon and vice versa. So you just don't have all of your employees occupying all of your physical space. Um, you know, and if some of you end up in a utility closet working, well then that's probably okay because again, this is just a temporary situation. So if you create a temporary workstation in a place that you normally wouldn't, you know, try to make sure that there are no um, physical hazards to that workspace, but it's a temporary solution to keep people safe. I do recommend that all of you start right now with no handshaking, no communal meals. I do recommend that you close down your kitchens, that you no longer use the coffee pot. People can bring their own coffee in, um, but you do not use anything where you're all handling the same communal um, uh, materials. So close down that kitchen, shut up that, that, uh, that refrigerator if possible. And really more than anything, those of you who are on this call, your leaders within your organizations, all eyes are on you. Everybody is going to be watching you to see what you do. So be in the practice of not shaking hands. Do not hug. Um, you know, make your excuses. It's awkward. None of us want to do this. We were all at a, a trade show last week. I've been in two trade shows last week. Not being able to touch, hug, and shake the hands of people that I've known for, you know, a decade is really, really hard, but we have to show leadership because if we don't take this seriously, our employees won't either. And our employees don't want to feel like they're overreacting. So show leadership because everybody's watching you. In terms of a sanitary workplace, provide as many cleaning supplies as you can. I know that cleaning supplies are very hard to come by. We can't seem to um, keep enough on the, on the uh, shelves. Um, if that's the sort of thing that every employee can bring a little bit of their own cleaning supplies to, to clean their own workstations and everything that they're dealing with, whatever you can to make sure that you have the materials to keep a, a clean workplace. Um, there are a lot of posters out there uh, where you can print off reminders of 
good hygiene in terms of um, covering your cough, using a tissue, washing your hands, um, you know, to, trying to do everything that you can to not spread your own germs. Um, and touching face is a very hard one for me, and I know it is for a lot of us, but reminders, even if you set these reminders at everybody's workstation so that we all don't forget, this is what we all have to do to keep each of us safe. Evaluate your workspace. Go through and look at what handles, what knobs, what resources, what, what equipment is being touched by everybody. Can you minimize that? Look and see, can you, are there certain workflows that you can adjust just to create a little bit more space um, within your workspace? Again, um, I do recommend closing down your kitchen and frequent cleaning of the bathrooms and everybody should be wiping up after themselves. If I walk into a door and out of a door, I want to wipe off that handle so that the next person has a clean handle, um, you know, a clean doorknob to, to use. Um, again, uh, if you do have a contamination at your workplace and you do have a professional cleaning staff that comes in to clean, it's incredibly important for you to notify your cleaning staff that there has been an exposure. They are a very, very high risk work group. They need to know their risks so that they're able to don the necessary protective equipment so that they stay health, healthy and safe cleaning our workspaces for us. Um, I hope you will make that a priority for you and do not forget those um, whose responsibilities include cleaning up after us and that puts them at risk. Um, I also, again, want you to show leadership in how you treat the folks around you and how you ask and request of them to clean up after themselves because that keeps all of us safe. I know I sound a little preachy on that, but um, I, I, I am a hugger. I am a toucher. This is, this is something that is hard for me. I have to lead by example, um, and so that's why I'm sounding a little preachy. Um, so getting into some of the issues. I had a lot of emails, a lot of questions. Can I send a sick employee home? Yes, you absolutely can. You always can. If somebody shows up unwell with symptoms, um, they may show up because they don't want either to use PTO or sick leave, or they want to show their loyalty and dedication and, and don't feel that they can take the time off because of the work pressures. This is the time where you remind them, if you have so much as a tickle behind your throat, stay home. And many of us can work from home and, and should work from home if we're not feeling well. So if somebody shows up sick, please turn them around and send them home and let them know that you want them to do that. Um, we're also uh, had a lot of questions about people who've said, I have, you know, elderly, um, immunocompromised, unhealthy, uh, vulnerable employees that work at our workplace. Should we send them home? Should we send them home if they don't want to go home? Should we send somebody else home who may be you know, who, who may have been exposed or maybe came, just came back from a, a trip to the Caribbean, should we send those employees home in order to accommodate our vulnerable employees? What I use uh, in terms of my guideline for deciding um, how to move forward on this is the Americans with Disabilities Act. This law applies to all employers with 15 or more employees, but in many states there are laws that apply as well that say that you cannot discriminate against somebody with a disability or a vulnerability, but you have to provide an accommodation if one is reasonable and feasible. So, what we recommend is to the vulnerable employee, ask them, look, this is kind of scary. Uh, we can set you up at home, or maybe we can't set you at, up at home, but would you like to work from home? We want to keep you safe. So volunteer 
that workplace accommodation to them, and then the choice is theirs. You cannot send them home if they are a vulnerable, at-risk work group. Um, I had a call from a janitor, um, a head of a janitorial company who has an elderly janitor who's in cleaning these buildings. Can he send them home? And the answer is no but you can offer some kind of work accommodation, such as perhaps changing the offices that he's cleaning so that it's, it's not quite as risky or um, offering him a, maybe some paid time off that he wouldn't be um, eligible for normally. <coughs> but treat them the way that they want to be treated. And remember, if you say to Joe, Joe, I'm gonna send you home, I'm gonna give you extra paid time off here because maybe you work in a place that you don't have internet access and Steve I'm going to send you home but I'd like you to work from home as long as you're not discriminating against anyone because of their age or disability or protected class you can treat these folks differently because again we're not creating precedent we're not creating a new set of rules we're just trying to protect our employees as we go forward and, and for goodness sakes, if a worker comes in and says, I need to go home because my doctor said so, do not overrule a doctor. In this day and age, or any day and age really, um, what their doctor is recommending is really what we should be um, providing. Um, so I've had a couple of folks contact me concerned about you know, that situation of, uh, you know, I had an employee that was on a cruise. I had an employee who works, um, you know, in a childcare center or at a school, and perhaps they were exposed. Um, so, um, and, and, I, and I, we just got a, um, and I did wasn't able to read the entire question, but there was a an employee whose daughter is now quarantined because perhaps she was exposed. What we recommend is that you follow CDC guidelines. So in that latter case where the daughter was exposed and so she's quarantined, follow the CDC guidelines on whether that means your employee may be quarantined. If, from what I understand, and this is of course four days ago, so who knows what it is right now because these things are changing quickly, that employee should be able and free to go to work. So um, unless that employee, unless that employee was themselves exposed, they typically can perform their normal function duties. But if that employee is vulnerable or if that employee works with somebody who's vulnerable or that employee feels really uncomfortable doing that and would like to self-quarantine, by all means, create an opportunity for them to do that. We really have to balance the true risk versus panic um, and, and, and remind ourselves we're following what the best experts tell us we should do. Again, that's changing because none of us have seen this virus before. None of us have been in this situation, but the CDC really is the best, um, the best guide. Now, if that employee was vacationing in the North, or, you know, the Cuomo region of Italy, CDC considers that a risk level three or four country where the outbreak is uncontained and systemic within that society, quarantine that person. Make sure that you do follow whatever the CDC requires. But if that person was in a level one or perhaps level two country where there is some virus, but it's relatively contained within a specific population, then that person is probably safe. We can't say forever, but you know, we can't say that with all certainty, but we're just doing what we can at this moment in time. Um, and what I recommend you do, again, bubble gum and rubber bands, take each situation as it comes, you are not setting precedent. Um, school closings, so uh, our schools are closed until April 20th. Um, I listened to a horrifying news report this morning that basically said most schools, and I think uh, Kentucky, perhaps, or Colorado, I can't remember, but um, one of the one one state, either Kentucky or Colorado, something that begins with a C sound, um, uh, has closed their schools for the rest of the year. Kansas. Um, Kansas. I knew it was a cut. So, <laughs> Thank you, Paige. You're welcome. That's why I have Paige on. <laughs> um, uh, they're closed for the rest of the year, and it's quite possible that that might happen. I'm in New York. I 
sure expect that to happen here. Uh, but as we go through, each person's situation is different. My children are older. They're good. I don't have to be here for them. Somebody's, somebody might have much younger children. Um, so the, the point here is to let the families figure out what their needs are. The last thing you want to be doing, this is a temporary situation. We're just trying to keep our populations healthy, keep our businesses running, keep our employees safe. So do not force your employees to send their children off to grandma and grandpa. We know that's a bad idea. We know we should not be doing that. But we also know, as Paige told me the other day, all those college kids are now home. All of those teenagers are now home. Consider letting them babysit those children and consider helping them pay for that cost for your employees. Um, again, paying for a babysitter is not something you would normally do. This day and age, maybe it's a great idea. Also considering flex schedules or job shares so that perhaps employees can watch each other's kids as each of them works. Again, your employees are the best people to figure out what they can do collaboratively and cooperatively and what they can do um, with each other. For those who can work from home, um, you know, there are a lot, there's a ton of technology out there. My company, our company is 100% virtual. So we use Google Docs um, for all of our uh, email and for our um, document sharing. Um, we have uh, Zoho, which I think at the base level is very, in, uh, this is maybe $30 per user for our, um, uh, a lot of our infrastructure and our client management system. We use Skype for our instant messaging and video calling. Um, so there are a lot of technologies out there. We use DocuSign to sign things. Um, you know, our QuickBooks system has a time tracker. You can, you'd be amazed at how much technology is out there to help us to do this. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the best technology in terms of cybersecurity. So you really want to do your research to make sure all employees have the necessary uh, virus protection, that they can use encrypted services wh where they can and how they can, um, and that you have your materials and your documents on some sort of a backup system. It's why I like the Google Drive that we use. But whatever you use, I'm sure you can figure it out within your network of people, but I recommend right now, before we have a mandatory stay in place law across the country, we have that in a couple of locations, that probably will be rolled out as this get, if this gets worse, send them home now and have them practice. Do they have the right passwords? Do they have the logins? Can they set up their printer? Do they need a printer? And if I had somebody call and say, we don't even have the right, you know, we need another monitor. Our folks need two monitors. Well, you don't necessarily need to buy another monitor. Just take one from your desk. And, and if the system is all plugged in, unplug the monitor, take it from your desk, get a new cord at Best Buy, and off you go. Again, we are, we are at rubber bands and, and toothpicks or toothpaste or all of the above. Um, what Paige did recommend that I share with you is if employees are taking technology, hardware or software from work, have them sign it out and that when, all the, when the all clear comes, you will take it back and they will return it either after they are no longer working with the company or when they are welcomed back. Finally, I really, 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 really recommend that you all do video check-ins, that you have at least a weekly, if not daily, video Skype with those who are sent home. It's a very isolating, very scary, very strange situation for folks who are used to working in a workplace. 55% of our body language, of our, of our communication comes through body language and 35% comes through our tone of voice. When you cut that off in this time, it is very discombobulating. It's not good for anyone. So Skype is free. Use it. You don't need the business enterprise one. We don't have the business enterprise version. There are a ton of these resources out there, but you need to make sure you can see every single person. Nobody cares if you're not wearing makeup. Nobody cares if you're in your sweatpants. Nobody cares if your office is in your closet. They just want to see you and make sure that you are okay. This is rubber bands and bubble gum. 
So practice now in order to make sure you've got what you need for when you really need it. And relax. None of us are used to this. You know, if you need a standing desk and the only way to get that done is with, a, with an ironing board, would I normally say that's a good idea? No. Is it a good idea now? Sure. If it makes you productive at work and it makes you comfortable, sure. Everybody's got kids screaming in the background. Everyone's dog is barking every time, you know, a car drives by or there's a squirrel. We all have that. This is not when we're trying to be our most professional selves. This is when we are trying to get through this very, very short and limited time. For those who can't work from home or don't want to work from home, try to provide as much protection as you can. Cleaning those workplaces, making sure it's sanitary, prioritize that social distancing as much as you possibly can. Listen to your employees' concerns. Oftentimes, the folks that can't go home are the ones that are in the warehouse, are the ones that are in distribution, that are the ones that are in the, 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 the manufacturing, that are the ones that are, um, you know, that don't work technology but have to move product or tend to product. Um, listen to what their concerns are. If part of your workforce is able to work from home and part of your workforce isn't, consider extending a paid time off policy for those who, who, for those who can't work um, or for those who can't come to work because they're sick. Extend PTO to those who need it at this moment in time. So, um, if, if you oftentimes have folks come to work sick because they don't want to use their PTO, that's not good in this moment. We want them to stay home if they're sick. So if you can couple to some, some PTO together, remember, it's not a promise forever. It's just for today. For those who can't work at all, so this is the hard part, for those who um, either their work doesn't allow them to, they're sick, um, or they just simply, you don't have a business need and you need to do a reduction in force. Here's where we're going to talk through those issues. So um, given that the quarantine period is 14 days and you have the possibility of people being exposed, if you can extend just for this period of time, your sick leave to be 14 days it is absolutely appropriate to do so in this moment. A lot of policies don't allow you to use vacation days if you're sick and the vacation days require previous notice, prior notice. Um, you may want to consider suspending that as much as possible. You want to give people as much time off and flexibility at this point as you can just to get through the next few weeks, hopefully not months, but weeks. In terms of your PTO, the scenario that I, that, I rec that I suggested earlier, where you've got some of your workforce can work from home and some can't, um, consider setting up a bank for employees who can work from home and aren't sent home without leave um, to, sh to donate some of that leave so that those who, ha who have to take leave um, have pay before it all gets cut off. Um, again, this is a, a short time period. So perhaps once we're back up and running, we can look back at those who donated pay and give it back to them, donated time off and give it back to them um, so that they're not penalized for their charitable and, and good faith efforts. Um, but it's really hard for some to say, I, I am, I'm able to work and get a paycheck and you don't have any PTO. So I guess you're gonna be out of a job and out of health insurance and out of everything. That's terrifying. So if employees can pull together to support each other, now is a great time. The other thing is consider allowing your employees to run into a deficit with their PTO or their wages if they need to. They can work it back over a period of time once we're back up and running if need be. Perhaps and hopefully we'll all come screaming back with such a productive workplace that we can forgive all of that debt. Um, but anything we can do to be creative so that employees can have that time off is really important. 
understand the short-term disability that you provide, um, family medical leave. For many companies over 50 employees, they are required to provide at least 12 weeks of uncompensated pay during, um, uh, during to take care of themselves or a loved one. So if FMLA applies in their specific situation, that's great. Some states and even some cities and counties have paid family leave, have paid sick time, have paid disability programs. So there are a lot of different laws that come into effect that you need to be aware of. Having an understanding of those so that you can guide employees on it is really helpful. The worst case scenario is if you have to have to terminate an employee or 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 um, lay them off. They need to understand what those benefits are. Those benefits are not rich. They tend to be around four to five hundred dollars a week, um, and they cover the basic necessities. Those are state-run programs. So if you have to reduce your workforce. Do the research beforehand to let them know what that pay expectation is. Also, different states have different rules about if you have to let them go, but they have a bank of PTO that they're working through first, you may want to have them file for unemployment, but that filing may be jeopardized or that pay may be jeopardized during that period when they have PTO. So it may be worthwhile delaying filing. It may be advantageous to file because some states allow you to do both. So anything you can do to make that transition as smooth as possible. The other thing that you really need to think about is health insurance. And I'm going to just check to see my slide deck if, I, if I'm talking about that in a little bit uh, later. Um, because health insurance is a very, um, is a very important uh, benefit. And if you go out on leave, um, if you're on leave, say for example, you're on family medical leave, the coverage may, is maintained. Um, the employee typically has to pay that health insurance, but you can offer to pay part of it. Um, if, the, if they have to go out on leave, at least they'll be covered. They will have coverage and you guys can work out pay. You could have them pay all of it, which will be hard for them given the limited resources they're going to have, or you can keep them on. But if you lay them off or they're on some form of furlough, you need to check with your carrier because a lot of them, it's a carrier specific situation. So for health insurance, for example, you may lay somebody off. They have health insurance with you. Now they don't, now they're not active. The health insurance carrier might say, no, that person is no longer actively at work. Therefore, they need to go on COBRA. Then you can determine who wants to do the COBRA. If you can help pay for that COBRA, that's great. You can pay for the COBRA and it's a tax-free benefit if you pay the carrier directly. You can pay the employee a portion of the COBRA and have them send you documentation that you sent them that money, that you sent the money to the insurance. And then if you have that documentation, it's a pre-tax benefit. If you just pay them the money for their health insurance, out of, you know, straight out, whatever portion, that is taxable unless you can validate that they are actually paying that money to the carrier. So those are all things that you really need to do research on. Uh, the house, so this is an example of things are redundant, you know, the, uh, the, this doesn't, I don't even know if this is relevant anymore, but the house passed a bill um, that uh, had free coronavirus testing, had paid emergency leave, which was two thirds of an employee's pay for three months through the Social Security Administration. So it was like an FMLA. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I think that is I think the, that the Senate and the administration have taken that piece out. Um, they've also enhanced some unemployment insurance. So some of the restrictions that are on, like you have to be looking for a job to get unemployment insurance. I think some of those provisions are being relaxed um, and, and some additional protection, protections for uh, healthcare workers and employees responsible for cleaning at risk places. Again, many of our cleaners are at risk. And so we need to be uh, mindful of that. This I don't think is even relevant. I don't even know what's out there now. So we will be keeping track of that. If I didn't say so already, please keep in touch with us. 
I be, will be posting a lot of material on my personal and our company LinkedIn page, and we will be communicating everything through your association. So we will be getting information as soon as we are aware of it, as soon as we get it. Relating to pay, um, if you have to lay off an hourly non-exempt worker, you do not need to pay them. That was a question that came out. Um, can you pay them if you want to? Yes, you can. You need to pay an hourly exempt non-exempt employee all time worked. That means if you have your receptionist and the customer service reps all out on, on at working telecommuting, they need to be tracking their time and you need to be paying them their time. They have to be paid for all time worked. Salary exempt, if they work for you, even a partial period of time during a work week, you need to pay them for that full work week. So a salary, an exempt salary person, that's a promise that you make with each other that you will pay them for the duties that you've asked them to perform. Um, so we have gotten questions. What if I need to like scale back because of business slowdown so that instead of working, um, a hundred percent, they're going to be working at 80%. Can I reduce their pay by 80%? You need to provide them with sufficient notice. Uh, you need to let them know that you're going to be doing that. And it needs to correspond with a change in their duties. Um, so, so what I mean by that is you can't do it mid pay period. Um, you can start a new pay period with a new agreement that you and the employee have of what that pay will be and what those duties will be. Um, there's a lot of kind of issues to consider with that. We're happy to help out with that and answer any questions that, that we can. The salaried non-exempt employee, you're still tracking that employee's time. So all you need to do is re-up that agreement and how that, how that relationship is established. Any, non, any change in work, change in status uh, for non-exempt non employees is pretty straightforward. The salaried ones, you just need to work on um, going forward. And again, I, I have received a lot of questions about if I have to lay off. If I have to lay off my salaried employees, if I have to lay off my hourly employees, is there a penalty? Do I have to pay them anything to do that? Typically, as long as you've given them notice, and different states vary on this. There are certain states that do require that you give notice, like some states require a significant amount of notice. So we, we should be checking your state requirements on that. Um, but once you've, once you've moved them to time off status, then no, you do not need to, um, you do not need to uh, pay them. Um, benefits, I talked about this very, uh, very little bit about health insurance and COBRA. Again, if you're going to pay some port point, then, um, you know, just make sure that uh, you're paying it either to the carrier directly or you're getting evidence that the employee has paid the, the carrier. Um, and be as creative with that as you possibly can. That's your homework. You really need to check that out. Also, workers' compensation. What happens if an employee gets sick? Uh, at work um, and one of my employees infects another employee. Is that a workers comp issue? Really Everything that we've read indicates that it is not a workers comp issue The only time it can be considered a workers comp issue is when you deal with um, your janitorial staff or your staff that's working in hospitals or in taking care of sick people if the if the duties of that employee are taking care of sick people or cleaning up infected places and you're likely to get work simply by performing your normal duties then it could be a worker's comp issue. Um, but again, we're not attorneys, so you will want to talk with an attorney about that. Um, and so, so this is the homework I'd like you to do. Research your state laws, your state leave laws, and your own benefits. Uh, call your carriers of all of your benefit providers to see what the deal is, to see how you can transition people from part-time to full-time to, to lay off if you need to be, if you need to do that. And help your employees understand the impact of a reduced workforce, of a telecommuting, and if necessary, uh, if you have to let them go. Um, and again, I do recommend bringing your employees in to the challenge of coming up with a solution because 
they will see that you're trying to do the best for them in light of this situation. Everybody knows we've never been here before. So finally, before I take your questions, I want to remind you that um, employee confidentiality, particularly when you're dealing with an employee who worries that they may have been exposed, an employee who's vulnerable, who doesn't want to share that they are medically vulnerable in this situation, you need to keep all of those conversations confidential. You have every right to treat employees individually based on their own needs, and it's really no one else's business. And so trying to keep that employee confidentiality as possible is really important. Remember, it's employment at will. If you let somebody go, if they're out for a period of time, they can are free to look for other work. Unless they're out on some sort of a paid leave, like family medical leave, if they're out on family medical leave, they really are not supposed to be looking for another job. And if they are, they could jeopardize their own leave status. Most important, communication is super essential. Communicate clearly with your employees. Let them know what you're trying to work out. And remember, this is just bubble gum and rubber bands, and we will get through all of this. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, ask Emily if she has any questions. Our emails are on this uh, page and myself or contact at um, our website is there. And again, LinkedIn with link in with me on LinkedIn. And what you got, Emily? Got a few questions here. So I'm going to start with um, if we decide to shut down, I know that you had mentioned this a little bit, are we obligated to pay those employees? No, if they're if you are, if they are no longer performing any work for you other than to pay out whatever remaining leave they have available to them, um, you, and and provided you don't live in a state that requires any significant advance notice for that, and again there are states that do require that, but under federal law, once they're no longer working for you, then you do not need to pay them. Okay, wonderful. Um, next question is, many of my employees are afraid to come to work. How do we keep them motivated to keep working for us if they have to go into the office and cannot work from home? So in those situations, I recommend that you take those concerns seriously. We're all scared. If they are a vulnerable employee, then try to provide some sort of accommodation or let them know that if they need to take leave, um, then, then, then to do so. I would encourage them to help you come up with a solution. You know, it, it's funny. I, I've, I've gotten a couple of questions from people saying, Claudia, how long is this going to last? And I think, oh my gosh, I have no idea. Why would anybody think I have a clue? Just like that, don't feel like you have to know, but, but make sure that they know that you care and that you want them to be part of the solution. Don't take it all on yourself. You don't have to take it all on yourself. Let them help you work through this. Yeah, and I would just add to that in the um, effort of communication, of explain to, the, explain to them exactly what you need and why you need them. If you do need them there, explain that. Um, if they can't get over the fear or they have you know, vulnerable people at home that they're afraid of um, getting sick, you know, take that into account. But you know, be honest as to why you need them and, and you know, for how long and, and see what compromise you can come up with. And it may be that you just have a philosophy of not letting people work from home and now is the time to get over that. This does not mean that this is the workplace of the future. This is just to give them, if they can figure out a way that they can work from home, then, then consider that as well. We have some questions regarding taking people's temperature before they come into work. Is that something that we're allowed to do? If somebody does have a fever, can we send them home? Um, what, what does that look like? You know what? I'm going to ask Paige on this, but everything I've read says no, don't. That's, that's really an extension beyond your authority and beyond your, your, um, your, your, uh, beyond your authority. And plus, if you do that, people can always take fever reducers. It, it's, it's, it's an, I, I think it's an unnecessary step. Um, yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that I would definitely be leery of. There may be some exception out there, depending on what type of industry you're in or who your clients are or things like that. But um, yeah, ha ha taking that, is, I, I, I wouldn't 
take somebody's temperature because that's not reliable, right? People, so it's so it's that's not the only symptom. It's not the only, you know, the only sign. So I would not recommend that. Um, but just to follow up on that, again, um, the CDC has been issuing a lot of guidance on that. So um, I, I would just keep touch with the CDC, um, keep touch with the Institutes of Health. There are a lot of resources out there. We will be looking at this. If any of you find resources that recommend certain forms of, of, of screening of employees or of customers, for example, just let us know and, um, and we will uh, we'll share that with everybody as well. We're all learning as we go along. I just saw somebody put in the chat that the governor of Ohio asked businesses to do that. Um, if that's the case, then yes. <laughs> yeah, if your governor says do it, do it. <laughs> yes, but, but if nobody has given you that permission, whether it's the, the World Health Organization or Dr. Fauci, who's everywhere, or OSHA or whatever, unless you've gotten that specific permission, I would not do it. But if you have, then do it. Great. Next question is, you know, every state, um, and you know, you mentioned county, even Claudia has some different rules. Where could people find um, their rules for their state or their county? Do you know? Uh, are you talking about like that, the, 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 the health, the health care, like the, the public health yes. questions? Yeah. Most states and counties have a Department of Public Health. Um, most mayor offices and counties have websites. Um, I know that's unrealistic for some of our larger clients who are, you know, literally across this, the country and, and, and how to deal with that. But um, like, for example, Westchester County has its own, um, its own uh, public health department. New York City has its own and the state has its own. So typically you cannot have one that goes beyond the other or you, so you, you want to be able to track all of them. New York right now, for example, is considering a stay in place um, law for the city, but the governor won't let them. So you, you, it's sort of like it's because it's decentralized and it's the problem with this decentralization, you really just need to know, familiarize yourself with those locations and, and, and those sources of information. Wonderful. Thank you. I know we've gotten a few questions too about if somebody has um, been around somebody or been in contact with somebody that has a confirmed case. Um, can we tell them that they must work from home? If there's no work from home capability, can we let them go? Um, so what, what are our thoughts there and how do we go about that? Yeah, so I, I, again, I think this is a case by case situation. Um, I think the situation where a daughter was exposed and so she's on quarantine, but, she, the, but the exposure, it's not like her boyfriend has it, but it was like she was at a conference with somebody that may have, that was exposed. Um, does that mean that you need to quarantine? The current guidelines say no. And, you know, we look at the president of the United States. He's been around a lot of people who have been, have, have had it, but he, he's not quarantining, although I, he probably should, but would, he, would Melania have to because of that? So how far, like how many degrees of separation do they recommend? What I have heard myself is that if the employee if, if, the, if, the, if the person in contact in that household was exposed, but does have not have symptoms and is currently quarantining at home, that does not necessarily put you, the employee, in quarantine. And this is when I would look at the, at the CDC and Fauci, the NIH, and follow the guidelines that they recommend. Again, if you really are uncomfortable about it, you can talk to the employee and see maybe the employee would be willing to do that. If you're requiring this of the employee against the employee's, the, against the employee's um, wishes, my recommendation would be to look at that very carefully, call us, let us work through that situation with you. If we say, well, go ahead, if you're going to do it anyway, go ahead, but I would pay them for that 14 days that they are forced to be at home without work because of your quarantine. If, um, I, I would just add to that to make sure that, you know, help them 
or advise them if somebody is at home and some of these exposed there it will be different if that person in the house starts showing symptoms right and then you know that the employee's been exposed they've been in a com, you know confined area with them so it, so that's what that you know this 14 days is is the incubation period so that's kind of why we're waiting and seeing but also remind the employee if they're going to be home to you know stay away from the person who might be exposed to show that social distancing within the house um so that you can and even so that if somebody does is showing symptoms it won't spread throughout the house i know it's easier said than done but the more that you can kind of remind people or, or give them guidance and go by what their doctor says it may be that somebody says yes you've been you've been near somebody who's been exposed so you need to stay at home then you know go by that medical professional's opinion and i also think just on one other point on this this is changing so um my son was sick literally showing every single symptom that the covid showed literally but and he had been in washington dc he he'd traveled um, but when I called his pediatrician, they said, well, he hasn't been with a known COVID, you know, somebody with a known illness. So therefore, he didn't qualify for testing. And without testing, we wouldn't know. And so I asked the doctor, do we stay at home? Do we go out? And they said, you can really do whatever you want. You, as the mother, can do whatever you want. He should probably stay in until he feels better. You know, it, that's not exactly very helpful, but it turns out he's fine and she was right. So um, he, he, it's just always scary. And I think an abundance of caution is, is good, but I think we just need to try and balance with what, what the latest information at that moment in time is. And it's going to be different. It's going to be very different. Based off of that, um, if there is somebody within your workforce that has a confirmed case, what about your confidentiality? Do you have to let the rest of your company know who's been in contact with that person um, to say, you know, maybe you should self-quarantine, maybe you should go get tested? What do you do in that case? <laughs> um, I would say that I think the health department is going to do that for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, and so, um, and it, this is a public health emergency. They, you know, anybody who is exposed or who, who tests positive, they get a full, um, assessment of who they've been in contact with and where they've been and they notify those people. So it probably isn't necessarily going to come from you, but I, there, there, as I said, because it's a public health risk, um, I, you do have, I, I think you have a little bit more leeway to explain the situation, um, but not going into details about how sick they are or anything like that, but you can just say somebody's tested positive. Um, and, you know, the health department may be reaching out to you, and this is why, you know, if, if, if the health department doesn't beat you to it. Well, and, and that presume I think that's under normal operating procedures. We're all going to see an explosion of these cases because this virus is fairly ubiquitous and they're just doing the testing now. So you can expect that, that, that just the testing alone is going to make this so great that they may not be doing that type of investigation. You're, they may not be notifying your other employees of that exposure, but it's certainly okay for you to say, all right, guys, we've all been exposed. We don't need to say by who, but there has been an exposure. So we're all going to quarantine. We're all going to do to follow the health requirements that are asked of us. So another way of maintaining confidentiality is just saying all for one, guys, here we go. Great. Thank you. Um, a few more questions, and I know we have about five minutes left, so anybody that has to jump off at the top of the hour can certainly do so, but we'll try and stay on a few extra minutes to get the rest of these questions answered. Um, can you, Claudia or, or Paige, tell the difference between what a layoff and a for long is for employees, what that looks like? In my mind, they're the same thing, um, although sometimes they have more of a commitment to rehire than, um, than a reduction, than a, a typical reduction in force, but that's why Paige is here. Paige. 
Um, generally, they are the same thing. I think of a furlough more from a government perspective, right? The government shuts down, employees are furloughed, they still have a job, but they they are, aren't getting paid and things. But as soon as things get passed, they usually go back to work. Um, a, a layoff is when there is no work, it's a reduction in workforce. There can be a temporary layoff if you know that you're going to be recalling these people or a permanent one if unfortunately things are, are getting that serious. So um, there, there are different things, but basically the reduction in workforce, layoff, furlough are all pretty much the same concept. Great, thank you. If someone is infected at work, is that recordable with OSHA? Um, do we have to shut down and if, if an employee has a confirmed case? There actually, I did some research on this. They have not said specifically whether they've, they've passed no laws and they've passed no um, regulations that uh, have created new obligations because of COVID, but they did just release a very lengthy OSHA federally released a very lengthy uh, guidance report on um a lot of workplace safety um, and how to handle it and what to do with it. I personally am not, neither Paige nor I are OSHA experts. And so we're not really certain what that, what a new obligation would be. But, um, but I do know that the only thing that they've reported out beyond what already existed is this new guidance. So I would recommend that folks Google, um, all you have to do is Google OSHA and DOL and you will come up with, um, or OSHA, Google OSHA, O-S-H-A and COVID-19 or coronavirus and you'll, you'll get it. Not Wonderful. coronavirus, just the document. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody asked, we're planning an open house in May. We expect about 200 or so people to come. A lot of time and effort has already gone into this. How should I proceed? Do I cancel now? Um, <laughs> you might just want to let folks know that you're on hold. Um, you know, we have the same thing. Many of the trade associations partners that are on this call right now have events planned in May. Um, and I think just let the participants know that you're, you're paying attention to it and, um, and, and you will keep them, keep them posted. If I were a betting woman, I would say my money is on, uh, you probably aren't going to, don't buy the canopies yet um, because I think it's probably not going to happen, but, but that's just my uh, pessimism. Um, and I, I hope that you do. I hope that you have a wonderful open house and I hope that we can all go. I just don't know that that's <laughs> do a wait and see on that one. Uh, next question we have is if you send an employee home sick, can you make them use their PPO or sick leave? Yes, you can. Yes, okay. certainly. Um, if, <laughs> if an employee voluntarily goes on vacation out of the country during this time, how do you handle their return to the office? Um, well, I, and this, this question has come up a lot, actually, um, believe it or not. And uh, again, I go back to CDC. Um, I think right. if, they, if, they go, if they go to a location where there isn't much of an outbreak and there isn't much of a concern, I wouldn't treat them any differently than our then our borders will, our health inspectors will, and the CDC calls on us to do. I would say though, I mean, with the travel restrictions, you know, the uh, President Trump just announced today they're closing the border with Canada. Um, people cannot, you know, come into the UK and they've closed it for a lot of people. Same with a lot of countries in Europe. So there's a lot of travel that's going to be disrupted. Um, so, you know, if, mm -hmm. if they're able to get there, then it's probably a relatively safe place. Um, but they should also be, you know, kind of on notice that they may not be able to get back. That's the problem that, right, that we've been seeing with the long lines in the airports because airlines are shutting, you know, down and things like that. So um, I, I would be really surprised if somebody's going to go full bore and actually leave the country because I, I don't know of many countries that are allowing that at this point. Well, and the other thing is that the president's guidance last night, or was it yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, it's all blending in, but that we restrict our numbers to 10, to 10 people, that we don't group gather in groups more than 10 people. He also recommended that all non-essential travel be canceled. So 
the, it hasn't come out in any formal document other than out of our president's mouth. So that's something. I don't know what that is. But that's right. something. <laughs> um, I think we have uh, time for two more questions, maybe, Claudia Page. Sounds is that great. okay? Yeah, that's sure. great. Okay. And for those, actually, for those who have to ring off now, um, please be in contact with us, connect with us. Thank you, thank you for, um, thank you for participating and um, we will be in touch. Great, thank you. Um, if you have an employee um, that maybe was sick or is sick, can you ask for a doctor's note to, um, you know, if that doctor's note says that they can't work, but then they go back to the doctor and they feel better and they have a doctor's note that they can work, are, are you allowed to ask for that doctor's note? Paige, I'm going to let you answer this. <laughs> well, there's a, a couple of different things. One thing is that, you know, know that people are being told that if they have the symptoms of this coronavirus, not to go to the doctor, right? So if you if it's mild enough symptoms that you don't need a hospital stay, they're probably doing a call, calling the doctor's office, maybe doing a video visit or something like that. So just realize that not everybody who's affected by this is going to actually have a, uh, have a doctor's note or bill because they're not going physically someplace. Um, that being said, there may be some record of a call or the video chat or however they're getting their guidance. Um, but if somebody is, but in general, if somebody is sick and they say, I'm out sick and they're at, and most companies have a policy of requiring a doctor's note for uh, if somebody's out for two or three days, then yes, you can ask, if somebody's out sick, you can ask for release from a doctor um, to, to come back, that they're able to work and that, you know, that there are no restrictions. So the, the um, other thing I would add to that is simply, you know, as I mentioned about my son, they aren't testing, um, at, at least now in any widespread way. Um, and especially if you haven't been directly affected that you know or infected that you know of um a doctor may not have anything to say um but this is also a good time if an employee feels sick i would send them home and i wouldn't require a doctor's note for somebody who says i got a fever uh, that's good enough for me you just stay home until that's better um and and i would recommend like they do at schools you know 24 hours with no symptoms i might even extend that to 48 hours with no symptoms and hopefully they can get to a doctor within that time. But uh, a lot of folks don't, a lot of sick leave policies don't let people out on sick leave without having to get a doctor's note. I think this is a good time where if they're sick, let them stay home. And if they are sick and they call in sick, can you ask if they have um, COVID-19 symptoms? Uh. Um, that's you, a hard one. That's that a hard it is, one. It, there's a, you know, you can have a conversation, you know, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, how are you feeling? Check in with us. Um, you know, things like that, like you normally would. Um, I would probably, you know, again, because this is a public health emergency, you, uh, you probably have a little bit more leeway and you could ask, you know, um, are any of the symptoms related to COVID-19? Because I mean, people are going to get sick other ways during all this time too, right? So, right. you know, so you can ask is, you know, are your symptoms related to COVID-19? Have you, you know, are, is there anything we should know? Please keep us up to date so that, you know, we are prepared on our end and we take the necessary action. So it's probably better to just ask that general question. Um, that way, if they say no, then you can leave it. If they say yes, then you might be able to delve in a little bit more or figure out, okay, you know, so, so what are we talking about? I think what I would recommend, um, because you really, under normal times, you are not supposed to ask those questions and they do have a right to privacy. What I would recommend is saying, in light of the COVID-19 outbreak, is there anything we need to be aware of or concerned about? Mm -hmm. Rather than right. what are your symptoms? Do you have those symptoms? I, th I think yeah. I think maybe keeping it a little bit. Do you need to tell us any? Is there anything right. we need to worry about in light of this? And also, um, yeah. And you can say normally I wouldn't be asking, but yeah, 
given that, you know, given the situation, we want to make sure we're taking the right precautions. Yep. The other thing I, I want to say on that just really quickly is that you also may have people, young people, healthy looking people who are immunocompromised, like somebody who has lupus or some other, um, you know, medical ailment that they don't want to share, but they then do request having an accommodation where they work from home. It's nobody's business who's working from home or why you still need to maintain that employee's privacy. Great. Um, I think this is going to be the last question that we have time for. Again, if we didn't get to all of those questions, I know that we still have quite a few in here. Um, we're just running short on time. Please feel free to reach out to Claudia and Paige. Their information is up on the screen. And I've also uh, launched a poll for you to complete to give us feedback on this program. So last question is, if we have to put people on um, temporary leave or full or low, how, or, and we are less than 15 employees, do we have to give a notice and how early? Um, and then what does that compensation, if it needs to be cut back, how much do we have to cut that back? So, um, and I'll let Paige uh, uh, correct me when I say something wrong here. Um, my understanding, I would look to see whether or not layoffs, um, notification of layoffs, and that's really what you're talking about. So the language, the, the, what, what you're referring to is notification of layoffs. I would check in your states to see what the notification laws are for layoffs um, and, and or shutdowns. And that should be on your State Department of Labor websites, or you can Google it. We can research it for you if you need that. Um, it, typically, if you're laying somebody off, once you've satisfied that notice, so let's say the, on the outside chance you do have a notice requirement because most organizations don't have a notice requirement. If you are in a state under federal law where you don't have a notice requirement, you do not need to pay anybody once they are no longer working for you. If you, if you close down the office or let people off on Wednesday and Friday is the end of the pay period, then on Friday, that employee who is exempt, non-exempt should be paid through that last moment that they worked, and anyone who is exempt should be paid through that pay period. Beyond that, you don't need to pay them, but if you are adjusting their workforce, their hours, their time, then you can adjust that based on the amount of work that you are going to be using of them going forward. So you can adjust that pay according to what their responsibilities are and how many hours they're going to be working going forward. Great. Paige, great. did you want to add anything? Yeah, Paige didn't interrupt me. That's great. I got it. Oh, yeah. I got, oh, I got it. I'm getting good at this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wonderful. Okay, well, I just want to give a big thank you to our speakers today, everyone in the audience for being able to attend and sharing all of their questions. Um, before we leave, again, if you haven't already, uh, please complete that poll that I'm asking you two questions on so we can get feedback from today's program. Uh, like I said earlier, a recording will be shared within 24 to 48 hours with you. And Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's webinar. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, everybody. And we will be in touch. And thank you for all of your help. We'll get through this, you guys. Yeah, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Have Take a great care. one.